So it came to us at sudden and great surprise that the canning stock route was now open and permits were being issued again. And as much as it was starting to look like Plan B was going to get promoted to Plan A, suddenly Plan A was able to go ahead again. With only a month's notice, we would be travelling the legendary canning stock route. So what is the canning stock route, and what preparations do you have to make to travel it? Well, watch this video and find out. The stock route itself goes from Halls Creek in the north of Western Australia, south to Waluna, approximately halfway down the state. Canning surveyed a route that cattle could be driven along in 1906, following in the footsteps of Lawrence Wells and David Carnegie. Carnegie was quite vocal that the area would not support cattle droving, but Canning thought otherwise. With the assistance of the local Aboriginal populations, a phrase that glosses over some pretty objectionable behaviour even by the standards of the time, because that assistance was in many cases not given consensually or willingly, he found a route through the desert. Two years later, in 1908, he embarked upon an expedition to construct 54 wells at locations identified by the earlier expedition, doing so at a cost of about $3.2 million in today's money. 37 of these wells were built on existing Aboriginal soaks, which unfortunately made them inaccessible to the native inhabitants of the area. Now, they weren't exactly pleased about this, as having your options for water supply restricted when you live in a desert is not exactly conducive to your continued survival, and as a result, attacks on the drovers subsequently occurred. Between 1911 and 1931, the stock route was only used about eight times due to fears of such attacks. Even with police protection promised, the wells fell into disrepair as nobody wanted to use this new stock route. In 1929, William Snell was hired to repair the wells, and noticed that the only ones left undamaged were the ones the Aborigines could still use themselves. Snell vowed to ensure that this was possible for all the wells he rebuilt. His expedition got as far as Well 35 before he gave up, possibly after learning of the death of his son. Canning was then hired in 1930 to finish the job and get the route open again, but even then, between this and 1959 when the final droving run occurred, at that point it had only been used about 20 times. The track did see a little more activity during the Second World War, where it was refurbished as an escape route should the north of Australia be invaded, but it would soon gain a new use. In 1968, the track was driven for the first time by Russell Wenholtz, Noel Keeley and David Chudley. Interest in the track increased over the years, and during the 1980s people started to tackle it by four-wheel drive. Since then it has become one of the world's longest, most difficult and most famous four-wheel drive tracks. Interestingly, the majority of four-wheel drivers tend to do it south to north, unlike the cattle drovers. Its roughly 1800 km length takes about two to three weeks to traverse, and it's extremely isolated. Aside from Kanawarichi community in the middle, there's nowhere to stop for supplies, no nearby towns, nothing. You are potentially hundreds of kilometres from the nearest other people, so you have to be self-sufficient. Breaking down could be life-threatening. The four-wheel driving requires some skill, although it will be far from the most difficult you've likely done. There is a lot of it to be done, and the stakes are very high though. Break your vehicle out here, and you or it may not make it back to civilization. Forget something, and you're just going to have to do without it. So how do you prepare for this sort of thing? What do you actually need? We'll start with fuel. It's nearly 1200 kilometers from Waluna to Kanawarichi, which is your first fuel stop. However, you'll be driving on a bit of sand. Some parts are hard packed dirt. We're expecting somewhere between 20 to 25 litres per 100 kilometres. This means that even with the Land Cruiser's 138 litre tank, we'll be carrying seven jerry cans of extra fuel. Your mileage may of course vary, and you may need more or less than this. From Kanawarichi to Billaluna, the next possible fuel stop, it's only about 850 kilometers, so this section's a bit less of a stretch, but you still do have to be prepared. We've decided to temporarily remove the rear seats, and I'm constructing a jerry can holder to go in their place. This fits six jerry cans across the car, and it's made of wood with a plywood base. 
Then I'm going to cover the whole thing in marine carpet to hide my questionable carpentry, but I'm not exactly much of an upholsterer either. Once we've got this in, you'd wonder how much space it actually saves. But once the car is packed, take a look at the rear seats and try to work out where you'd fit them in the vehicle again, and then you realize quite how much space they take up. So in this, four jerry cans of diesel will be kept. Diesel isn't unsafe to keep inside the vehicle, unlike petrol. Just make sure the jerry cans are tightly sealed. Don't ever keep petrol inside a vehicle though, it's not safe at all. The flash point is significantly lower and petrol generates fumes at room temperature. In the other two slots there will be two jerry cans of water, totaling 44 litres. A further 40 litres will be kept in this footwell tank with hoses on either side to drain it. This gives us 84 litres in total, which depending on various factors, will last both of us about a week. How will that do when we're gone for a month? Well, one of the things that makes it a stock route is wells, and some of them have been restored back to being operational. The water should be drinkable, but it needs to be made safe first. This doesn't generally need to be much more than just boiling it, but boiling huge amounts of water is going to use a lot of fuel, so instead we've got an MSR Guardian purifier filter. This ceramic microfilter has pores so small it can even filter viruses out of the water. So, on the subject of water, water is most critical for survival, but we're also going to need some food. With the requirement for it to be stable for a month of travel, this is naturally going to involve a lot of canned food. In the 40 litre angle, in which we're going to partition as being two thirds freezer, one third fridge, we have three kilos of mints, several packs of sausages, and two and a half kilograms of cheese, all frozen. So basically it's pretty much just frozen or canned, with a little bit of fresh stuff for about the first week. Now, a month of cans is, well, a lot more volume and weight than you'd initially think. Do be aware of that when packing. But because we're us, we decided to write a script to tell us what to buy. In here we define all of our meals in this YAML file. So here we got tacos, goulash, nachos, spaghetti, pacchiarelli rigati, sausages, burgers. Now I don't want to know what's in those buns, but unopened they last for months. Soup, wraps, noodles, mac and cheese, saladas, tinned spaghetti, waffles, pancakes, bacon and egg wraps, and then we've just got some assorted stuff to add some variety to the whole lot. Now the hot dogs in a can are interesting, they came out exactly like the frozen ones. For dessert, there's also some other options from the traditional canned peach halves. You can try mango, papaya or mandarin. And lastly, a hot naan bread is quite nice, even by itself. And then run a python script to calculate the desired quantities of each ingredient. This works out great, until you realise that you were a little disconnected from exactly what the output looks like, and end up with half a crate full of corn chips. Well, a delicious mistake, of course. Also, I later realised that we never had any baked beans. Further inspection reveals this was actually due to a configuration error, where the meal of baked beans includes two tins of spaghetti instead. Now that is a problem that only we would have. Also, when you're packing things into multiple crates, keep the multiples of the same item distributed between crates. This means you don't have to get both crates out to get one meal. Additionally, we've also given some consideration to where the lunch supplies go, keeping them separate to the dinner supplies, as we'd make lunch when we're halfway to somewhere, but make dinner when we're set up at camp. Now, another factor here that needs to be considered is the amount of waste generated. Pasta seems like a great idea, packing density variable of course, because it's shelf stable, the sauce is in a jar, with a little supplement of tomato paste in a can, just requires a bit of cheese from the fridge. 
However, the glass jar can't be squashed flat like a can, and making it uses, compared to the other meals, quite a bit of water and a lot of gas to boil it. This all seems a bit mundane, but you'll really need to know in advance how much of everything you'll need, because there will be no shops. And you really want to know how much rubbish it's going to produce, because there will also be no bins. Finally, we've got a soda stream. Now I'm not normally a fan. Replacing the carbon dioxide cylinders seems to work out more expensive than just buying soda water, and for a company so concerned about plastic waste, they sure do like obsoleting the machines if they don't break first, rendering the whole thing a big chunk of useless plastic. But for this application it's perfect, because you can make many litres of soft drink from the water you have, carrying only the device and a few bottles of syrup and a spare gas cylinder because these things don't make anywhere close to the 60 litres they promise. Back to the car, we're bringing some spare parts. If you break down out here, you're going to need to fix it yourself if you want to get out, short of paying tens of thousands of dollars for a tow truck. Even if you don't know how to fit them, it's still worth carrying them. Someone else might, or even if you do have to get towed to the mechanic, you then don't need to wait a week in the middle of nowhere for them to get the parts in. We're carrying a little more than you might otherwise, because originally we were going to be travelling alone, which is very much not a recommended approach. Two spare tyres is a must though, because with an 1800 km journey, if you do end up with a flat tyre, it's entirely possible that due to the distances involved, you may well end up with a second flat tyre before you've got the first flat tyre fixed. Sometimes you end up with two flat tyres, because instead of it being an errant nail or a screw or a a bit of twisted metal on the road in the city, often it's a sharp rock and you run over it with two wheels. We've also got a tyre plugging kit, but fit a new tyre in preference to using it because it's far from a permanent fix. In our box here we've got spare air and fuel filters. A spare air filter is useful as it'll be quite dusty and you may end up just getting one irredeemably clogged. We've replaced the usual ram air head on the snorkel with the Donaldson top spin. This is a cyclonic pre-filter, much like what you'd find on a Dyson vacuum cleaner. That just sorts out a lot of the dust before it even goes down the snorkel. A spare fuel filter is also useful as you'll be doing a lot of filling from jerry cans, which will get a bit more dirt into the system. Additionally, if you get water in your fuel, this may ruin the filter and you'll need to change it out for a spare. Spare shock absorbers are also a good idea. 1800 kilometres of tough off-road conditions mean that you can end up breaking one, especially if you're not careful. We're also carrying spare CV joints. These are possible to blow up, especially when you're driving off-road. Typically, this happens when you have a wheel spinning in the air, which then contacts the ground. If you do break a CV joint, you will still be able to move, but you'll be in two-wheel drive, which will make dune crossings difficult. This probably isn't an essential spare, and given how much they weigh, you may not want to bring them. We've also got a spare alternator. Now on the 200 series, it's mounted quite low, so it gets exposed to a lot of mud, sand and water. We also do push it quite hard with the lithium battery setup as well. Given that we'd have no other way of charging batteries if it fails, we did bring a spare. Wheel bearings. They're an underrated and critical spare though. You can get a flat tyre, you can brake shock absorbers, but you can still move the vehicle. You blow up the engine or transmission and someone can still tow you. But if you've had a wheel bearing fail, you're not going anywhere without a lot of difficulty. Aside from that, we've just got a bunch more things to be able to bush mechanic a fix. A few bits of rebar, some heavy gauge fencing wire, some steel box and angle sections, few electrical spare parts, tools to fit stuff, silicon hose repair tape, duct tape, and some welding rods for a bit of jumper cable arc welding should it come down to it. I really hope it doesn't though. Oh, and cable ties. Cable ties are good for everything. Keep in mind though that the more weight you carry, the more likely you're actually to have something break in the first place. So maybe leave the spare gearbox, axles and diff at home. You're also going to need camping gear, obviously. Now I'm not really going to go into this one, because fundamentally it's no different to any other camping trip. You're just going to be doing a lot more of it in a new place each night. Now don't forget anything, because there's absolutely no quick trip into the nearest town to pick up the thing you've forgotten. We've only packed one tarp and a reduced set of poles, and I don't even think we're going to set that up every night. 
Now, navigation. You're also going to need to know where you're going. Although the canning is in theory a big main track with a lot of side tracks coming off it, a lot simpler than say a state forest with its crisscrossing spaghetti of tracks, there are still points where you must go the right way lest you follow a track to nowhere or unintentionally end up somewhere you shouldn't be going. Don't try to use Google Maps though. The coverage for off-road tracks is very poor and although you can save an area for offline use, you really can't rely on it to stay working offline. So the first line of navigation is the ever-present Osmand. This can work entirely offline using OpenStreetMap data downloaded to your device. OpenStreetMap data is actually pretty reliable for off-road travel because if it's incorrect, people update it. Always record your track as you go, not just so that you can update it, but also if the map's wrong you can still backtrack because you know exactly where you came from. In addition to this I've got the GPX files downloaded from Explorers on the map as well for a second set of lines, although this does start to become reminiscent of the parable that the man with one watch knows exactly what time it is, the man with two watches is never quite sure. The other thing to be aware of is that some devices are overly dependent on AGPS data from the internet to get a GPS fix. You'll find that after a week of not being connected to the internet, your phone is slower to get a GPS position, but on some devices it can fail entirely. This can be hard to test without leaving you disconnected for a week, so we got a backup option, which of course is a Garmin e -trex. Runs for about 25 hours on a pair of double A's, readable in direct sunlight, and will handle getting wet and being dropped. Actually, why just have one when you can have two? The backup backup option is of course the paper maps and a compass. But don't just relegate these to the glove box until all else fails. The West Print map has an entire history lesson on it, and the Outback Traveler's Track Guide book has a lot of information about the track conditions. As for communications though, forget the mobile phone. There's no phone signal on Telstra once you leave Waluna all the way until you get to Billaluna, 150 kilometers south of Halls Creek. At Kanawarachi, however, there is mobile signal, but it's not Telstra, it's Optus. Yeah, that Optus. Singtel's basically given them satellite backhaul for a 4G microcell, and you can use a normal Optus SIM there. Telstra, however, were unwilling to provide coverage in the area. So we're going to be using a lot of HF radio. Now we've got a full video on that one down in the description, but we'll be using one radio for APRS position tracking and the other for voice contact. We've got a regular scheduled contact with Mark in Adelaide, and we've also got Winlink set up, which is basically email over HF, which we're using to keep in touch with a few others. Should all else go wrong though, we have a PLB. These used to be otherwise known as EPIRBs, but that name now only refers to the bulkier ones that float on water. This doesn't do two-way communication, it's really just a distress beacon. Meanwhile, Rusty's got a Garmin inReach unit. This is basically a satellite phone for millennials. Instead of making phone calls, it sends and receives email and SMS, as well as supporting regular position reports. This is certainly a smaller and lighter unit than our HF radio setup, but with HF Radio you can provide your own infrastructure instead of paying for a company to provide it for you. Now of course Starlink warrants a mention. Unfortunately we couldn't use it on this trip as it doesn't cover far enough north in Australia to have been useful. That line however is steadily marching north and by 2023 we'll cover a lot more of Australia, meaning that if we ever do want to repeat this trip it will probably be usable out there by then. A shame, because I did want to do the first live-streamed canning crossing. Then there's the permit. Applications are open again. You just have to go online, fill out the form and pay for it. Providing there's nothing exceptional about your planned trip, approval is immediate and you have your permit. Previously, you needed a second permit from the Australian National Four-Wheel Drive Council for the middle section between Wells 16 to 39, but that's now included in the permit from Kujuwanka, only one permit needed. If you want to leave the canning to visit Lake Gregory or Lake Stretch at the north end, you'll need a different permit for the Peruku Indigenous Protected Area, but this one can also be obtained online. Accessing the station between Well 2A and Well 5 via Kanyu Station is free, but towing a trailer is prohibited. Anyone who is towing needs to enter or exit from the southern end via Granite Peak Station at Well 5 or Glen Isle Station at Well 9, but a small fee applies to both of those. 
For all of the permits and a bunch more information that might be handy to have written down, we gathered a folder full of PDFs, which since we don't own a printer, we just sent off to Officeworks to be printed and bound. And then lastly, there's just the drive-in. We're looking at about a four-day drive from Melbourne, as we have to go across most of the country to get there, and those are going to be long days. Join us next time for the next stage of our adventure where we begin the trip by driving most of the way across Australia. Subscribe so you don't miss it and see you next time.